Hey, picture book people. This is today's featured book. This is today, Gus. Oh, why are you listening? My dad will be doing fan art from the book. Enjoy! This is a book that had a longer gestation than any of the 45 books I've done in my life. This one took nearly seven years. I actually just went back to look at when I wrote the first draft, and it was 2013. So this 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 book is um, it's it's my <laughs> my my life's work. It uh, it does feel like a culmination of everything I've seen, everything I've learned, everything I've ever wanted to put in a book. And the premise is it's a kid writing a letter to a visitor from another planet, explaining the world. So if you come to Earth, here's what you need to know. What was the best thing about making this book? Wow, wow, wow. Well, I, I think meeting all the people. And it really was a, such a collaborative book in, in more ways than, than any other book I've worked on. Um, not only working with my editor, Victoria Rock, and designer, Sarah Gillingham, at Chronicle Books, uh, but with everybody along the way, I mean, asking people their favorite birds or color names or going into a, an elementary school in New Jersey where there was a fourth grader called Nate who was blind and realizing, oh, wait, I have a page in this book where there are blind kids reading Braille and maybe Nate do you have an idea of a secret message that they could be reading? And without hesitation, he said, yes, can I go and type it for you right now? And he raced off to his Braille typewriter and came back with the secret message, which I wish, you know, we had the money to actually emboss the pages so it was real Braille so, um, so that it could be read with fingertips, but, uh, but I just drew it in there. And so just knowing that, that, that there was a kid who gave me a secret message that worked its way onto the page. And there's something like that on almost every page in this book. And so when I look at it, I just think of the great, extraordinary good fortune I feel to be alive on this planet with my fellow human beings um, and and all that we all that we can share in the way of experiences and stories. And, um, and I hope that, that this book goes out and that people find it and enjoy it and find something familiar in it and something new and that, uh, that they are encouraged to think about what they would write as a list about their planet because I know I left things out and... This is this is one kid's letter explaining the world, but it's the world as they see it, this this particular kid. And we all see our world in different ways. So it's a, it's if anything else, it's a call to to appreciate the world we live in and to make every day count, even even if we're mostly at home. Um, it almost heightens the appreciation for for everything that's waiting for us when we can step back outside. This was just a small portion of our talk. To hear the full chat, find Picture Booking wherever you get your podcasts or visit picturebooking.com. For more videos like this one, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening. Hope you have a good day. Bye-bye. Hi there, Josh Sippy here, creator of the Gotham Writers Conference. With over 25 years of experience teaching creative writing classes both in New York City and around the globe, Gotham Writers took a bold new step to create a writing conference unlike any other last October. With the help of a handful of top agents, we created a conference that was voted best in New York in our very first year. Now, we're back for year two. Due to the pandemic, the conference will be hosted on Zoom, but you'll still get the same quality of content as last year, including the opportunity to spend four hours with two agents in your genre, which is why I'm here talking to you listeners of the Picture Booking Podcast. 
This year, we have our very own picture booking table where you can discuss your project with two agents and up to eight other picture book writers in your Zoom room. The Gotham Writers Conference takes place this October 16th through 18th. If you have a picture book project, you are ready to get in front of some excellent agents. This is the place to be. All writers must apply for a spot at the table so that we can verify the market readiness of the project. But once you're accepted, you're well on your way to making the connections you need to get your book published. Welcome to the Picture Booking Podcast. Here's your author, illustrator, and host, Nick Patton. Hey, Picture Book people. As you heard, today's presenting sponsor is the Gotham Writers Conference. You can find links to the conference in the show notes and at picturebooking.com. We have an outstanding show for you today with Sophie Blackall. But before we get to today's talk, I'd like to take you back two years ago to the last conversation with Sophie. What's uh, what's next for you? Oh, I am working on an 80-page picture book, <laughs> which... <laughs> I love which it. Which is about everything in the world. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm more than a little ashamed to say it has just been pushed back another year because I was not going to meet the deadline um, because I'm painting little eeny teeny things um, because of everything in the world. So it's <laughs> taking a very long time. Um, uh, but uh, but it's it's a lot of fun, even though it's my entire existence right now. Now today, we get to celebrate that book that she first told us about in that 2018 chat. And it's everything you'd expect from a Sophie Blackall book about everything. And to top it all off, we're doing a book giveaway with this episode. Today's code is EARTH. If you want a chance to win one of the books featured on the show, go to picturebooking.com slash win and become an email subscriber. The giveaways for U.S. residents only must be 18 years or older to participate. You have until Monday, September 28th, 2020, to submit the code EARTH to me. Here's hoping we can fill a spot on your bookshelf. Make sure you stick around for the end of this episode when we share books from Angela Burke Kunkel, Brooke Graham, and Lori Orlinski. And now my chat with Sophie Blackall about today's featured book, if you come to Earth. Enjoy. I'm Sophie Backall, and I'm an author and illustrator, and um, I'm Australian, which is why I sound like this, even though I have lived in the States for just coming up like next week. I think it'll be 20 years. 20 years. So are you a, so is it, are you a citizen of the United States? I, that's a, that's a, a a loaded question. Um, <laughs> I don't, we don't, this, this could be off the, off the record. I just, you just got my curiosity no, right away. No, it's fine. 20 years. It is just, um, so I'm, I'm being audited right now by the IRS. And, uh, you know, when you're, when you're audited, you, you end up having a daily relationship with your auditor. And at one point she said, why aren't you a citizen? You've been here for 20 years. And I said, there, I, said, I used her name, which I won't use now. I said, there are two things that keep me awake at night. One is the fact that I have not yet got my citizenship. And the other is you. <laughs> she, <laughs> she laughed. But, but she actually did because I thought there's, being audited is even more horrible than you ever imagine. But it did make me like I'm going through all of this awful paperwork. I may as well just just do the whole hog and do my citizenship at the same time. So I'm in the throes of applying for citizenship. So so that's where I am. I'm a permanent resident. I have a green card. But soon, soon, hopefully, I will be a citizen. <laughs> I didn't mean to step in it there, but uh, yeah, twenty years. <laughs> just wondering, just wondering. So today we're gonna t- we're gonna talk about this uh, this amazing book that you did. Um, so let's just could you just introduce it to us? Um, if if you come to Earth, yes, this is this is a book I'm holding a copy in my hand that hasn't come out yet. Uh, but this is a book that had a longer gestation than any of the. 45 books I've done in my life. This one took 
nearly seven years. I actually just went back to look at when I wrote the first draft, and it was 2013. So this 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 book is um, it's it's my <laughs> my my life's work. It uh, it does feel like a culmination of everything I've seen, everything I've learned, everything I've ever wanted to put in a book. And the premise is it's a kid writing a letter to a visitor from another planet explaining the world. So if you come to Earth, here's what you need to know. And it began because I was working for Save the Children and UNICEF and both of those organizations were sending me to countries to, to meet children all over the world. And I went to Bhutan and Rwanda and Congo and India. And meeting these kids, I would take books to share with them. But usually we couldn't speak to one another because they had very little English and I had zero Kenya Rwanda or Bhutanese or, or any of the, you know, other languages where I was where I was visiting. And we drew for each other. But what I really wanted was a book that I could give to any kid and say, here is a book that is about us. It's about you and me and the planet we share. And I thought, I think I need to make that book. So so that's where the idea first formed. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much to, there's so much to take from that, but let's start with, I, I want to start with why travel. Let's start with travel. Um, and why is so important to you in, in, in your life? Well, the past few months I've been living in retrospective travel. Um, I talked to my parents on the phone and we relived trips that we made together. And my partner, Ed, and I sit in the evening and dream about where we could, might possibly go when the world is open again. And, and travel just feels like this incredible luxury of, of something that we were once able to do relatively freely. And growing up in Australia, um, a lot of Australians feel... Yes, I think that, that we are just right down there in the bottom of the world and it's an incredible, rich, diverse country, but also it feels isolated. It's an island in this fast sea and it takes a long time to get anywhere that isn't Australia. Um, so when we go, we, we go for long stretches. Australians travel the world and it's very common that we take a year off between school and, and college to do this, to go and travel. And then for many Australians, and it's a, you know, it's obviously it's a very privileged thing to be able to do to travel, but for many of us, it becomes something that we can't live without. And so you get back to Australia and you work and you save until you can go again. And um, so that has just been deep in my blood from from the time I left school and and then being able to I, I often say to kids that my very favorite three things are kids books, making books and traveling. And in my work I get to do all three, which um feels you know, almost too fortunate. Um I can't quite believe I get to call it work. Uh but being asked to travel with Save the Children and UNICEF um, was some of the greatest experiences of my life, um, seeing places that I cannot imagine being able to get to see in any other circumstances, you know, walking for hours through a jungle to a tiny village where the children had never seen a car, had never seen anybody they didn't know. Um, all of those things, you know, change you. Mm -hmm. What is... What does that work like? I mean, just tell me, take me through a day or uh, an event in, in when you're doing when you're doing that work with Save the Children. Well, with Save the Children, uh, the project was about literacy, so it was visiting countries where children learn to read without books. If you can imagine that, so they learn to read with teachers writing sentences up on a chalkboard, which is often just a stone wall, a lumpy, bumpy stone wall, and the they, the teacher reads the sentence out loud and points to the words, and the kids repeat this, and then they replace the sentence. So it's 
very dry way of learning to read. They have great, rich um, cultures of storytelling in these countries I visited, like Rwanda and Bhutan, but they just don't have books in, in the way that we do in, in the printed form. So the, the project was to visit as many schools as we could and talk to kids and talk to teachers, and the teachers had not gone up with books either. And to begin to introduce the idea of, of books and also to do workshops with prospective authors and illustrators so they could begin to, to make books in their own languages. So it's not about just bringing our books from the West and saying, here you go, here are some books, you know, have at it. Um, because you know, we want books that, that children can read in their uh, local languages that are made by, by local people. So they're stories that are relevant to them, stories they can engage with that are familiar. Um, so it, my part was going to see these communities and trying to learn as much as I could about them and then helping save the children make um guides for teachers of how to use books in the classroom once they had them. So it was sort of a long, uh, many-stepped uh, project. And one of the steps included engaging local carpenters to make bookcases. And those bookcases would be filled with books and delivered to schools. And inside the bookcase would also be a mat made out of recycled plastic fibers, woven fibers and bright colors that would be rolled out onto dirt floors of classrooms so kids could sit on the classroom rugs just like they do in classrooms across the United States and have story time, which is something they've never had before. Yeah. So how is how have those adventures and, and that experience shaped your art and your storytelling? I mean, we have this book because of it, but in general, I mean, how has that how has that changed how you view things? Yeah, I think the, probably the most obvious response to that, and, and there are many, many different ways that it's shaped my, my work and my life, uh, but one of the most obvious responses, I think, is it literally opened my eyes and made me see things in a different way. It made me notice details. And because with these guides that I was helping save the children and, and UNICEF make, I was drawing these people and cultures to send back to them. I wanted to make those pictures as accurate as possible, which meant that I had to look more carefully than, than either ever I had in my life before. I couldn't make any assumptions. So, so it was a lot of documenting, a lot of taking notes and photographs and asking questions and you know, how do you tie this cloth that you're wearing around your waist? And what about the the pin that you use to fasten it here? And what is that significant? And should it be fastened always on the left? Or, you know, whatever these details happen to be. Um, but also, you know, food and eating and living. And how do you do all of these things? Because they're all different to the way I do them. And I want to learn how you do them and, and depict those details as accurately as I possibly can. Yeah. It reminds me, you know, they say that uh, when you travel, um, the reason why it feels so transformative is you're, you see the ordinary as extraordinary. So when you're at, when you're, when you're on a street that you've, you've been on your entire life, you, you start becoming blind to the beauty of that street. But when you're in a, a different place, right? It just, all, it's like sens- sens- it's like you're like a little child again, seeing the world brand new. Exactly, and you can take something as simple and everyday as like a letterbox, and look at letterboxes in countries around the world, and they're completely different. And it's just like one very small way of kind of subverting your expectations. And I remember the first time I went to China and. The, the schools looked like prisons to me and the banks looked like playgrounds and all of these things like you, know, you go into the bank and there'd be all these cute animals and I think why these are not in the schools where, where are the cute <laughs> animals in the schools the schools have high fences and no windows and, and so it's all of this kind of inverting the, the, the expectations and really just kind of 
teaching yourself to go in with with you know a complete um, open mind and open eyes and and then I think whatever work you produce out of that is is bound to be influenced by that. Yeah, yeah. When you were saying when you were describing the story of of you and the students not understanding each other's language, but then connecting through their drawings and your drawings, it just you know it it's so easy to forget that 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 art is such a it is a, a visual it is a universal language right it is it is a, a a language that that everybody can 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 understand so absolutely i yeah i can't um but there were there were moments where it was our only language and also moments where we didn't have in Rwanda for instance they didn't have paper and pencils, so we drew with sticks in the in the dirt, in the in the the ground in the middle of the village, and the kids all came around and we all had sticks and we drew these great big pictures together and laughed and, you know, teased each other and were able to have relatively, you know, complicated, nuanced exchanges, but it was all body language and smiling and gesturing and drawing and um I always say to kids, you know, in a, I've done school visits where you know, there's a great big rowdy auditorium of kids and, and, you know, you're having trouble kind of gathering them and then you start to draw and instantly you can hear a pin drop because nobody knows what you're going to draw. It's this one, it's this one magical thing that you can show somebody else what's inside your brain. And you just begin with a mark on a page and it can go anywhere. And and if you can do that, you can you can hold a thousand kids in the palm of your hand. And I'm not very good at drawing on the spot. Someone like Paul Zawinski or Brian Foker can can or Lewin Sam can draw, you know, and, and have everybody speak spellbound and it can actually come out looking like the thing they're attempting to draw. <laughs> you know, I always stand back and go, oh, that's not quite a way. Never mind, let's move along. <laughs> so I'm in awe of those kinds of draft people. But anyway. But it is, it is it, no matter what, I'm, you know, I mean, obviously a, uh, I'm nowhere near anybody's level. But you know when it, when you just just drawing and showing that freedom and showing what you just described there. I mean, it is so true that that um, I used to be afraid to when you go in, into classrooms and stuff to, to draw for the kids because I knew it wasn't going to look mm-hmm. like my final art because I spend all this time <laughs> redrawing my final art yeah. to get to a certain point. Um, but it's it's uh, there's just such magic in that, and you know, as you were talking, it makes me think. You know, it, it's all. I mean, reading is, is all visual too. I mean, we're just, and it's just the, the, the I mean, the letters are, are all shapes, right? That, that we all learn to, that right. means one thing, right? Uh, this is just the simplest right. form of that, right? Pictures. Exactly. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and in our defense, as, as uh, the people who don't have the magic pencil, like, um, <laughs> like some people do, I I always think that I'm doing kids a service because I will show them a bad drawing and say, oh yeah, look, that didn't come out quite like I imagined. <laughs> and I and I think and I hope it gives them confidence to to also make drawings that that are a little more lopsided and a bit wonkier and a bit stranger than than they thought. And then to embrace them because I think that's the, I. I I hate the idea that people are afraid of drawing and, and we learn that fear, that, that fear isn't inherent. It isn't our natural fear. We learn that from comparing ourselves to other people and feeling like there's only one way to do something. And, you know, when you look at little children, they have no fear. And my one of my greatest wishes is that we could all hold on to that that great, you know, joyous, abandon of of drawing exactly what comes out of our pencil yeah i've got a a a six-year-old and a four-year-old right now so they are both in prime time and they both got it's so fun that because i'm watching two different artists with completely different styles like uh 
just just create these amazing stories um with with their pictures it is i you know um yeah every day i mean we are there's a little little battle at home because they use so much paper but i just keep bringing more of it home <laughs> and she's like my, my wife's like you know use the coloring books and i'm like hey, here's some here's some loose leaf paper go for it kids and so she comes yeah. when she's gone yeah. she comes home and there's like a million new uh uh pictures that they've made but they're just so i mean i i'm jealous i, I am jealous of my son's style it's just mm-hmm. so pure and raw he's the he's the mm-hmm. 4 year old and um uh the you know he gets emotion in there and he gets you can you can tell what he's drawing now it's but it's still that n- uh, naive energy and oh it's just i i love it i mean it reminds me of like uh um, Oliver Jeffers. I'd say he's, he's Oliver Jeffers, you know, I mean, he's, he's, he's <laughs> in a raw state. Yeah. It's amazing. It's so fun. I just, um, I, yeah. <laughs> Oliver made a, made a, uh, we'll start getting specifically into, into the story, but he made a, uh, you little cameo in this. I mean, you, uh, referenced, uh, his book in this story, um, with, along with a lot of extra, uh, Easter eggs, I imagine that, that are in this book that I, that I haven't noticed. Yes, and did you did you just happen to notice that? Oh yeah, yeah, it, it stood up. I mean, ah, you're, you're looking closely. <laughs> I mean, when you're reading the story, um, you... well, no. So, so the story behind that is that um, Oliver and I had a conversation, a very innocent, general kind of "what are you working on" kind of conversation when we were both in the early, early stages of our respective books. And we very quickly realized we're the sort of thinking stomachs that we were <laughs> making essentially the same book. And um, we're, we're friends and our studios are not far away from one another's in Brooklyn. And so we made a plan to meet the next day or you know, the next week and sit down with, with what we've done so far and actually compare them. Said, oh, maybe they're not that similar after all. And it was so similar. It was crazy. We had almost the same lines of, in our manuscripts and some of the spreads were, I mean, our styles are quite different, but what we were drawing was, it was the same, it was the same picture. And it was just, it was astonishing that whatever we had kind of plucked out of the ether you know, we we just both reached for it at the same time. And um, whereas my book was this response to meeting kids all around the world and wanting to make a book that we could all share, that that explained this planet that, that we all live on, Oliver's was a desire to make a book for his newborn son, that he brought his, his boy home from hospital and realized you don't know anything you know I, he was carrying him around the house and saying here's the kitchen and this is where we make food wait you have no idea what food is <laughs> and so it, it it was born out of that so they they arrived at the same place but from from slightly different genesis um but so once we realized we were doing the same thing we kind of set out to to try and deviate a bit and and make these different books uh, as much as we could, but we stayed in touch throughout both of our um, processes on 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 our projects. And and all of this was done much more quickly. And I said, you know, you you know what, you you work like <laughs> this is lightning speed. You go for it, and I'm going to sit back, put another book in between, which was Hello Lighthouse, and then I and then I did. If you come to us later, and um, all of this is a is a, a much shorter book as well. I'm just making excuses for myself now. <laughs> if you come to us, it's eighty pages long, eighty pages. <laughs> so it did. Uh, it took many, many years. Um, but uh, but we did put each other's books. There's a in each book. There's a there's a kid reading, and we put each other's book jackets in in those, which was a very sweet little little Easter egg, as you say. Well, I didn't know. I didn't know that he that he had your book in his. So I'll have to go back and 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 dig that yeah. up and find that. Mm-hmm. I, I did right. not know that. <laughs> That's, yeah. Isn't that funny that uh, how how that happens? But I I mean the I I love uh, the line that you said when you were describing this book in the beginning that 
you wanted something to share to, cause when you're having this experience with somebody who's, who's different than you and you know, they're different, they know you're different, but what you're looking for is that, is that connection to make, to make them us. Right. And, and yeah, that's, that's so beautiful. Um, and, and, and I just want to highlight that, 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 I mean, I feel that in everything that I want to do from, you know, you know, this point on is how do I make them us, right? How do I, how do we bring us all together, right? That's, I mean, as an artist, and, and here you've got this beautiful, beautiful example of that in, in this book that is, uh, it's, it's powerful. Oh, thank you. I, I hope so. I hope kids will find things they find familiar, things they recognize, not only themselves, but everyday things, but also things that they've never seen before. So, so the idea is that it's both those things. It, it shows us ourselves, but also shows us a great, vast, diverse world of all of the beautiful and different and, and extraordinary things that make up this planet. And some we'll never get to see, some we'll only ever see in books or pictures, um, and others hopefully we will get to see for ourselves, especially when the world has settled on its axis. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I want to ask you, you get this idea in your head, right? That, and you kind of understand the direction you want to take this, this story. How do you wrap your head around tackling a book where you've basically decided that you're going to draw everything on Earth? <laughs> well, that's partly why it took seven years. Um, you know, coming back from these travels, I thought, right, this is the book I want to make. I'll get started. And then I really quickly realized, oh, I have no idea where to start. So what I needed to do was talk to more kids. So I invited myself into a second grade classroom at the Brooklyn New School in New York. And for six weeks, I went in every Monday morning and hung out with these 23 kids. And those kids are the kids in the classroom pages in the book. Um, their, their names are in the back of the book as well, all 23 of them. And over six weeks, we... We drew together, but mostly we talked and we talked about what makes us human and what do we most love about this planet and what do we need to fix in this planet of ours and, and is there life beyond Earth out there in the universe and, and, and what do we think that looks like and what would we say to a visitor from another planet if they were to come and what would we want to tell them about Earth and all of those things. And, and over six weeks, you know, they they taught me so much and we had we had a really great time. I still have a lot of their notes and drawings and um and uh, just uh, it was fantastic fun and, and um I can't wait for them to see the book, even though by now they are all probably far flung and in middle school <laughs> is my guess because this was a few years ago, so they are, yeah, they're probably in sixth grade by now. It's what I love about the book, though. I mean, the fact that you that you put them in it. So, so like, I imagine. If, okay, so I think to myself, okay, I've got this. If I had this idea of 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 basically, I'm going to draw everything. I'm going to paint everything and, and and explain it all. I would think the first thing I would think, well, wow, we're going to have to use some broad strokes here. But you kind of went the complete opposite and said. I'm going to get as specific mm -hmm. as possible and I'm going to have people, I'm going to have characters in this story that are from, from real life. And, and, and I mean, that's the magic of, of what I feel like the story has. I mean, it just, it feels so, I mean, it, we, there's the whole breath of it, but then it, each little bit of it feels so personal and so real. So, um, is there other characters, other real life, uh, people that are characters in the story? Yes, yes. Um, I decided uh, quite early on, once I started painting at least, I decided I wanted everyone in this book to be somebody I had seen. 
either with my own eyes, somebody I knew in my life, someone I had met in my travels, or somebody I had just seen on the subway in New York City or, you know, on a ferry in Sydney or in the fruit market in, in Kinshasa in Congo. Just people I had actually seen with my own eyes. And then I had to go beyond there with, um, there's a spread about occupations. It's the line is, um, growing ups do lots of things to make the world work. And so I wanted to show all the different kinds of, of not all, but a sampling of all the, the kinds of things that, um, that people do for jobs. And I wanted to make those all real people. So there are some celebrities in there. Um, you might spot Beyonce, for example, <laughs> you might see um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, and then there are a few, I have a cameo in there, um, but there are also people, I just had so much fun looking up, like, all right, I'm going to have a taxi driver, let me find a taxi driver online. So the taxi driver is... Um, uh, He's wearing a turban, he has a beard, and he was a taxi driver in Melbourne, Australia, who found, I think it was like $1,000 in cash on the back seat of his cab that a passenger had left there in an envelope, and he drove all over the city to return it to, to the passenger. And so there was this brief story, he was in the news of this, you know, <laughs> honest cab driver. And I just thought, oh, fantastic. I'm going to, I'm going to immortalize him in this book. So almost everybody in those occupations pages has some little story there, but they are all real people. You can, you can deny this and you can, you can burst our bubble, but we have a, uh, uh you know, in our in our family, we're huge Ivy and Bean fans, and so there's there's a thought there's a thought that somewhere in this book is Nancy, and, <laughs> and it could just it could just be you know just the way it is, and you don't you don't have to. I could I'm not going to tell them if it's not true, but you know they just. There is a there is a belief that that there's a, there's Nancy. In, in that that is there. There certainly is a Nancy like <laughs> character in there. So let let's go with that. <laughs> um. Well, I I mean I love that I you know that is, and as as um uh, as an illustrator I mean that's something that maybe I that I've I'm learning that I need to do right. I mean, you've done it at this extreme, extreme level, but you don't draw. It's like, what is it? There's, there's some famous saying where you don't draw just a chair. You draw that specific chair, right? You go find and, and there it is, right? There it is. You're doing that in, in everything that you do here. This is, and you can just feel it, um, in, uh, in, in every, Every, every piece of art that is in the story is just is just so uh, uh, so personal and so real. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I think a lot of that for me was I I learned that from working in my studio with um with my studio mates who are all picture book makers, and I think we probably talked a lot about them last time. But um, but it's worth saying again that working in this communal space has taught me so much. And that specific thing, you know, I think I had my own vocabulary of chairs and fabric patterns and, and things that I had in my, you know, my artillery or toolkit or whatever you want to call it that I would pull out whenever I needed to draw those things. And at a certain point, I realized, no, no, they're, they're um, a million different chairs and ways to draw chairs. And there's something to be said for an illustrator who has that world that all of their books are firmly situated in this world. And, you know, I'm thinking of someone like Dr. Zeus or, you know, you recognize the same plants throughout. And in some ways, Sergio Ruzzi's books are like that. He has created this world. He has a very similar palette. And there's something enormously comforting and and um, welcoming about opening each new book and kind of knowing that you're existing in this particular world. Um, but Sergio also, if you look at his furniture, he uses eBay as a resource, which I had not even 
thought of. But the beauty of it is he will search until he finds a chair or a table or a cupboard that he wants to draw. And then the person selling this cupboard has taken photographs of it from every angle. So he can then draw it, you know, as as his book goes on and you see different views of the room, he has this perfect reference of this piece of furniture from every angle. And I thought that was just genius. Um, but someone like Brian Fluker will research everything so meticulously that, that he has the very best understanding of the thing that he is trying to draw, whether it's how it is built, whether it's the history of it, whether it's the context and the people who are around it at that given time, he is showing us that thing, you know, as truthfully as, as he can possibly show it. And, and then someone like Robert Watkins takes a thing and then reinvents it in a way that just <laughs> takes the top of your head off. So you kind of look at his building and you just think that is architecturally impossible, <laughs> but it is incredible. And I only your imagination could have produced that thing. And I'm in awe. So you know, w- working alongside these incredibly talented picture bookmakers, um, and I haven't even talked about Doug Salati, who is our fourth um, and newest studio member, and, and his work is just breathtaking um, in in very different ways. He just makes things alive. He just his drawings, you know, just almost leap off the page. There's this kind of dynamic quality to them that. Um, that leaves me um, jealous and uh, <laughs> full of admiration. When I put when I put this book on our so like I read the book and I was super excited about it. I, I set the book for our our bedtime stories and the kids usually come in and then they put their books on. I said no no other books today. And I think when I did that, um, Melissa thought, oh good, this is going to be a short story time. Um, and I think you could read this book as a short story time. You could just sit there and, and read the words and flip it through. And, and I think it's kind of the beauty of this book where you could, where it could be just a, a, a short read. Uh, but I had no intentions of it being a short read. And we just spent, I think at like the half hour mark, she's like, how long is this book? I'm like, eh, it's, it's, it's a little, it's a little. you could, you could just pour over and we, especially with kids, you know, you ask them, you read the, the line and then you just ask them, well, what do you think? Or, and, and you just start asking, I forget like what are some of the questions, but we just explored every inch of this thing and it was so much fun. And there's every page just engages you in a different way. I, so That's I just lovely wanna, to hear. Yeah. So I just want to ask you to, to, so that people get a feel for this book. Um, could you just describe one of the, your favorite? I mean, I'm sure you don't have a favorite, but one of the spreads in, uh, in the story that, that, that excites you. Oh, goodness. You know, you know, by now I'm not going to be able to just describe one, but <laughs> I wanted this book to be, Somewhere between Richard Scarry's books, which I loved as a kid because I loved that that exact thing of being able to pour over the pages and make up stories within the stories and to imagine, you know, where would I be on this story, in this story? And so, for instance, in If You Come to Earth, there's a page of, of we live on this planet that looks like this, blah, blah, um, and we live in all kinds of houses. And so there's a page which has all different kinds of houses. And as a kid, I I would have loved that to try and imagine which house would have been mine, where I would have lived, to be able to follow the little road around in between. Um, but then there are pages like the um, the birds page where I asked tons of people what their favorite birds were and, and painted all of those birds flying in the sky so that they make up the shape of one giant bird. And the families in, in the picnic in the park all have little stories and they all interact with one another somehow. Like the ball that's being bounced from one family and, and someone in another family is catching it. And there's a dog that um, is, is straining on its leash and, and another kid from another family is going over to pet it and so on. So there are just these little interactions throughout, um, which is one of the things that I just love to watch in real life, whether it's 
walking to a park or on the train, strangers interacting, something that we can't do so much these days, which I miss enormously. Um, I, I had fantastic fun with the clothing page in that same way, kind of finding clothing from all across the world and hanging it on clotheslines, but then showing people in cutaway rooms in their houses on the buildings of either side of the clothesline getting dressed. And there's everything from an astronaut suiting up to a bride getting stepping into her shoe to a... Um, uh, someone from a philharmonic orchestra getting into his tuxedo and there are characters throughout the book who are recurring characters Um, and I had incredible help throughout with this book on that clothing page that I'm looking at Um, in the top left corner there's a a mother getting the toddler dressed ready for the day and the mother in this book is someone I met at a book signing years ago and she came with her children and she's uh, originally from Kashmir and I asked her when I wanted to uh, depict a Muslim mother in this book, I reached out to her and asked if, if I could ask her some questions about how she wore her Ferran, which is the um, kind of overdress that she wears when she was, uh, her name is Sumaya, and uh, she's thanked in the beginning of the book, but she was incredibly generous and helpful and she sent me all of these photographs of how she wears it and the history of it and how women will pin their sleeves back so that they can and um, push their arms out to, to do things like washing up or dressing a, a wriggly toddler into a sweater. And so those little tiny details um, were all, you know, thanks to help from, from other people. Um, on the weather page where there's all different kinds of weather in the world, uh, there's a little tiny Easter egg to one of my favorite children's books um, in the snowy scene. It's uh, it's Peter from The Snowy Day, the Edger Jack Keats book. Um, and in the traffic scene, which is the most Richard Scary like of all the books, of all the, of all the pages rather, um, it's just a million different models probably not even a hundred different cars and buses and, and things. But again, there are little, to me anyway, funny stories and things that happen in between them. Like the garbage truck is dropping a bag of garbage behind it. And there's a broken down combi van because when I was a kid, there were always broken down combi vans. They, they just, <laughs> the poor things were always on the side of the road blowing smoke. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, yes. Everything is a, is a treat in this book, and even when you have like a, a um, that ocean uh, spread where it's where you know you say the sea looks empty, and you show us uh, a whole landscape, and then you flip the page, mm-hmm. and, and underneath you see all these fish and a whale, and they're all, and you're like, you keep going that yeah, the, so you get that, and then you get the animals, and then those birds. Oh, I just, that, that is so beautiful. <laughs> so, oh, thank it, you. Um, it's just such a, that sequence is, I mean, all of it is, is amazing. But that sequence, when you ended with um, those birds uh, um, flying in the shape of a, of a bird, is, uh, <laughs> um, it's so beautiful. And it, it's almost, it, you know, you know, it's, it, it shows what that book, what this book is, where it is, where you're looking big picture and you see a bird, but then you, as you dig down deeper, you see the specifics of, of the individual birds. Um, and I think that's, I mean, that's the beauty of this book where you are talking about everything in the world and, 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 and how it works. But then you, are, but as you look into it, you're like, well, that's super specific how they pin up their, their sleeves so that they can, I mean, that's the detail that that's in this, and then the the overarching theme of, of of how everything works in this world. It's amazing. Um, I will thank you, thank you. I I hope that um, I hope that it won't drive parents crazy because um, as you <laughs> had the experience with your own kids, I've started to hear that a tiny bit because you know as you know this book isn't actually out yet, but I have sent it to. a a couple of friends and my stepdaughter babysits and and took this book over to the four year old she babysits and she said that's 
that's all they do now. Every time <laughs> she goes over, he insists on sitting down with this book, and it's just hours and hours and hours, and he has his favorite pages, and they, he insists on reading every single name of the color paints on the, the tubes of paint where it says these are the colors you need to paint everything in the world. Um, and that was, that was actually a funny page because I, I put that out to the, to the internet. I put it on Instagram and asked people for color name suggestions. And I think I got something like 1500 suggestions and I chose 70 or so that uh, that actually made it onto these color tubes. Um, and when the book comes out, all of those people will will get a print of this page to commemorate their contribution. But some of the names had whole stories that went with them. Um, one of the colors is a kind of pink color, and the name is Nettie's Cap. And it was a story about this man's um, great aunt, I think, who knitted caps for everybody, and it was always in this pink, this shade of pink, and everybody in his class had one of these caps, and they all dutifully wore them, so it's Nettie's cap. <laughs> I love it. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say, um, like I said in the beginning, I mean, I think you could, I mean, maybe not the first reading of this book, but I think you could you could story time this quickly, and then you hand it to the kids. Oh, sure. And, and then sure. you let them explore. I think, you know, some books are those long form, you're, you're invested in this thing, or you're going to, but this book kind of, I feel like can play in both worlds where it can, it can be a quick read and it can be a play toy where you are going to, um, spend hours digging through, uh, yeah. what's going on here in, in these spreads. So I think, uh, I think it works both ways and, uh, so I think it works for the parent. That's, that's... I hope so. I hope so. It, it it occurred to me early on. Maybe it doesn't need text. Maybe this could even be a wordless book, and and that would further this idea of it being universal. If we don't have to worry about a language, but I realized that. I don't know about you, but reading wordless books to my kids would take forever mm -hmm. because there's nothing to <laughs> there's nothing to move you along. And so I thought, no, I'm gonna give it text. So it does have a rhythm to it and, and as you say, you can you can gallop through it if you want to. Yeah. Yes. And we all know that we all know that kids, especially when you're at home with them, you read books over and over and over again and and for me, you know, with my kids, I always loved books that I felt I could read over and over and always discover something new. And so I always try and do that with the books that I make. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was a, I think it was a smart call because it still works for the kid to pick up by themselves. And then it still gives parents, uh, rails. <laughs> Cause with, yeah. the, with all those, um, <laughs> It, it would, yeah, <laughs> it would definitely not be ever a short book. <laughs> no. oh, I love it. Well, before I ask my final question, um, now that you've, you've, you've made the story, you've created the thing that, um, you, you've painted everything in the world. Um, so what's, <laughs> what's, what's next for you? What's, what's the next thing that you're taking on? Well, I have, I have two big projects that I'm working on. One is uh, a grown-up book about visiting the houses of my favorite writers, which has been temporarily put on hold as I can't travel. Um, but it's a, it's a labor of love and um, very much love being part of it because I can't imagine anything more fun, really. But I went and, and visited Beatrix Potter's house and Herman Melville and Virginia Woolf and Jane Austen and so uh, so it's a sort of part travel log, part memoir, part writer's biography, um, which uh, which I'm just loving, loving, loving working on. But will be sometime before it comes out. And the next uh, children's book, um, or there are two. One I have nearly finished, which is called Negative Cat, and that's a book that uh, was about my own um, cat who did not have many redeeming qualities, um, <laughs> but this cat does have one redeeming quality, but I won't tell you what it is. And the other is another project with my uh, beloved editor, Susan Rich, um, with whom I worked on uh, Finding Winnie and Hello Lighthouse, 
And this is a book that is close to my heart about uh, the farmhouse where we have our place in upstate New York. And having done a book about everything in the world, this is a book uh, which is very narrow because it is about one house and the stretch of time of, of one family with 12 children who were born and, and raised in this house. So it's sort of similar themes that, that I always enjoy exploring, which is the passing of time and the cycle of, of life and everything that um, all of the, the ups and downs and things we learn and things we regret and, and, and things we pass down through generations and, um, and the things we leave behind. So that book will be is, is waiting in the wings. I have written it and I'm just about to start drawing it and it will be a pure joy. That's awesome. So my final question is back to if you come to Earth, and that is, this might be impossible, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> what, was the, what was the best thing about making this book? Wow, wow, wow. Well, I, I think meeting all the people, and it really was a, such a collaborative book. In, in more ways than, than any other book I've worked on. Um, not only working with my editor, Victoria Rock, and designer, Sarah Gillingham, with Chronicle Books, uh, but with everybody along the way. I mean, asking people their favorite birds or color names or going into a, an elementary school in New Jersey where there was a fourth grader called Nate who was blind and realizing, oh wait, I have a page in this book where there are blind kids reading Braille and maybe, Nate, do you have an idea of a secret message that they could be reading? And without hesitation, he said, yes, can I go and type it for you right now? And he raced off to his Braille typewriter and came back with the secret message, which I wish either we had the money to actually emboss the pages so it was real Braille so um, so that it could be read with fingertips, but, uh, but I just drew it in there. And so just knowing that, that that there was a kid who gave me a secret message that worked its way onto the page. And there's something like that on almost every page in this book. And so when I look at it, I just think of the great, extraordinary good fortune I feel to be alive on this planet with my fellow human beings um, and and all that we all that we can share in the way of experiences and stories and um, and I hope that, that this book goes out and that people find it and enjoy it and find something familiar in it and something new and that, uh, that they are encouraged to think about what they would write as a list about their planet because I know I left things out and this is this is one kid's letter explaining the world, but it's the world as they see it, this this particular kid. And we all see our world in different ways. So it's a it's if anything else, it's a call to to appreciate the world we live in and to make every day count even even if we're mostly at home. Um it almost heightens the appreciation for for everything that's waiting for us when we can step back outside. And now to end the show, let's hear some more kidlit voices share their favorite picture booking moments. Hi, my name is Angela Burke. Kunkel, and I am the author of the picture book Digging for Words, Jose Alberto Gutierrez and the Library He Built, which is published by Random House Schwartz and Wade and is illustrated by Paula Escobar. My absolute favorite moment uh, when creating this book was I had um, written the book, it had been acquired, and the editor and I were communicating back and forth about showing moments in Jose, uh, the main character's life about why reading is important and what all of us discover 
when we open a book. And I was struggling a little bit with that. And I was writing a scene where I really wanted to put an illustration note. And I wanted to describe the moment of opening the book was like sailing a ship and going forth. And maybe there was some pirate imagery, or maybe there was some imagery that recalled a journey. And I held off on putting the illustration note in there. I resisted because I already had too many. And picture book writers hear a lot to leave room for the illustrator. And I said, no, 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 I can't put that. So I left that thought off and I sent out my revised work. And months go by and uh, Paula's doing her sketches. And months later, I get an email from the editor with sketches and I open it up and on the spread where that scene was is a beautiful full page illustration of the two main characters, older Jose and little Jose sailing forth on a ship um, with beautiful scenery of fish and mermaids and the buried treasure, which is actually a book And it is exactly what I saw in my mind's eye, yet a thousand times better. And the takeaway for me there is believe in your illustrator, leave room for your illustrator. And sometimes the vision lines up because you wrote it in there and you didn't even know it. And it's even better than you can imagine. Hello, my name is Lori Orlinski, and I'm the author of the multi-award winning children's book, Being Small Isn't So Bad After All. Being Small is a book based on an experience that I went through with my daughter Haley, who is now seven years old. When she was three, she came home from school crying. I found out that her teachers had hung a growth chart in her preschool classroom. While all of Haley's friends were at the top and middle of the chart, Haley's name was all the way at the bottom, with no other names in sight. Unable to find a book to empower Haley to accept herself, I wrote Being Small Isn't So Bad After All, which has been praised for its bullying prevention messages. Being Small has a positive messages for kids of all sizes. In fact, you can take the word short out and sub it in for any quality that makes kids feel different. While writing the book, my goal was to help parents by providing a resource to those who might face a similar situation that I did. But the book did so much more. When I had the honor and privilege of reading the book to patients at Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago, I asked the kids what makes them different, and I kept it light by saying that I was left-handed. One girl raised her hand and told me that she was different and special because she had received a heart transplant and had someone else's heart beating in her chest. I got chills all over because I saw the messages of my book resonate with a child who has overcome something monumental. Haley is now seven, and she's proud to be the shortest in her class, even her school. She accepts herself for who she is and is self-confident and empathetic to others who have been bullied and treated differently. I know I'm special because I could do things that other kids can't do. I, I could find the best hide-and-seek spots. I am awesome at limbo, and I am the last one to get wet when it rains. Being Small Isn't So Bad After All is perfect for kids of all sizes, and it's available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, and Walmart. Hi, my name is Brooke Graham, and I'm the author of Go Away, Worry Monster. The picture book is about a boy named Archie who has anxiety. The night before Archie starts his new school, Worry Monster appears. He loves helping Archie worry, and soon Archie feels so anxious that his head hurts his tummy flutters and his heart pounds. He realizes that the only way to feel better is to make Worry Monster go away. Go Away Worry Monster gives children useful strategies to cope with their anxieties and stress, showing them how to make their own worry monsters leave during stressful periods of their lives. The best thing that happened to me in the process of the story being created was sharing the journey of publication with my students. They have loved hearing about how a story I typed on my laptop became an actual book and they're very excited that it will soon be in their school library. 
one of the students I teach who has learning difficulties and particularly struggles with writing has been so inspired by my journey that he has started to write his own story. But best of all, sharing the journey of the book with my students has allowed us to discuss worries and anxiety during wellbeing lessons. This has been wonderful because not only have the children learned simple strategies to help self-regulate, they've also developed a greater awareness of mental health. Thank you for listening and have a great day. If you'd like to share your favorite picture booking moments with us, record an audio file on your phone and email it to nick at nickpatton.com. Thanks for listening today. Until next time, take care.